In November, another person joins the group in hiding. His name is Fritz Pfeffer, a long-time acquaintance of the family. He's given a bed in Anne's room. Margot will now have to sleep in her parents' room. Anne is not happy about Fritz Pfeffer. He is strict, and he often scolds her if she does something wrong. And then he goes and tells Anne's mother. They argue often. In fact, the others have arguments as well. After all, it's very hard for eight people to live together at such close quarters, and always with the fear of being caught hanging over them. Pfeffer describes to them how the Nazis and their helpers close off entire streets and then force all the Jews out of their own homes, including children, the elderly and the sick. For weeks now, he says, the Nazis have been rounding up thousands of Jews and sending them to Westerbork transit camp. From there, they are taken in cattle trains to Eastern Europe. Their homes and shops are ransacked, and entire streets fall still. Anne has a friend, Sana, in Westerbork. Six months later, another friend, Hannah Lee, will be taken away. Anne feels guilty. I feel wicked sleeping in a warm bed, while somewhere out there my dearest friends are dropping from exhaustion or being knocked to the ground, all because they're Jews. Anne shivers with fear when she hears that Rauter, the German chief of police, has announced that all Jews must be removed from the Netherlands by July 1st, 1943. In secret, the Nazis have decided to kill as many Jews as they can. But Anne also feels encouraged when she hears that people are resisting the occupation force. Resistance fighters in Amsterdam have set fire to the city's board of records. This will make it much harder for police to track down the Jews. The radio updates the people in hiding about developments abroad. Armies from a number of different countries are trying to push the Nazis back. In July 1943, Allied armies defeat the German army in North Africa. British, Canadian and US troops land in Sicily. The German army is now surrounded. The Russians are attacking from the east, and from the west, British and American air forces fly bombing raids every night over Germany. From her room, Anne can hear them passing overhead. The number of airstrikes on German cities is increasing daily. We haven't had a good night's rest in ages, and I have bags under my eyes from lack of sleep. Factories, even entire cities are being levelled. Amsterdam is bombed as well. This time, the British Air Force tried to bomb an aircraft factory, but the bombs fell on a residential neighbourhood and all just a few miles from the secret annex. The destruction seems to be terrible. Whole streets lie in ruins. It still makes me shiver to think of the dull, distant drone that signified the approaching destruction. The Western Church, just a block away from the secret annex, is an important building in Amsterdam. In the summer of 1943, the fire department makes a film to show how they can protect it if necessary. You can just make out the secret annex in the picture. Maybe Anne was writing in her diary at that very moment. Wednesday, 23rd of February, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this morning, when I went to the attic again, Peter was busy clearing up. He finished quickly and came over to where I was sitting on my favourite spot on the floor. He stood and I sat. We breathed in the air, looked outside, and both felt that the spell shouldn't be broken with words. I knew then that he was a good, decent boy. The two of them spend a lot of time together. 
but after a few months, Anne doesn't feel as in love as she used to, and she distances herself from Peter. Instead, she spends more time with her diary. Wednesday, 29th of March, 1944. Dear Kitty, Last night, Mr. Bolkestein, the Cabinet Minister, speaking on the Dutch broadcast from London, said that after the war a collection would be made of diaries and letters dealing with the war. Of course, everyone pounced on my diary. Just imagine how interesting it would be if I were to publish a novel about the secret annex. The title alone would make people think it was a detective story. Anne starts rewriting everything on separate sheets of paper, all for her new book. Tuesday, 6th of June, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this is the day the English news announced at 12 o'clock, and quite rightly, this is the day the invasion has begun. Communique number one. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The German army is not expecting this invasion. The Allies are strong, but their advance is painfully slow. The German army fights back hard. Only when the Allies have established a beachhead will they be able to gain ground. Anne's father Otto keeps a map of Normandy on the wall. On it, he charts the Allied advance. Every day, every hour, they listen for the latest news on the radio. Would the long-awaited liberation ever come true? Oh, Kitty. The best part of the invasion is that I have the feeling that friends are approaching. Anne and Margot hope they'll be able to go back to school in October. They're already making plans for the future. Margot wants to become a maternity nurse. Anne wants to be a writer and journalist. While rewriting old pages in her diary, Anne continues to add new ones. She starts thinking more and more about herself and the world around her. It's twice as hard for us young people to hold on to our opinions at a time when ideals are being shattered and destroyed, when the worst side of human nature predominates, when everyone has come to doubt truth, justice and God. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. It's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering and death. Anne would never get to see the peace. The Allied forces are approaching Paris when on August the 4th, 1944, someone phones the German police in Amsterdam with the message there are Jews hiding at number 263 Prinzengracht. Immediately, an SS officer drives to the building accompanied by Dutch policemen. They march in through the warehouse and climb the stairs to the offices. The staff are taken by surprise and cannot do anything. Jo Kleiman and Victor Kuchler are arrested. The police walk on through to the annex and arrest all those in hiding. They are taken to prison. Beb Foskow and Weep Gies are left behind. Later that day, they have a look in the annex. The police have ransacked the place looking for anything of value. In among the mess, Meep finds Anne's diary and other papers and decides to keep them for when Anne returns. After her arrest, Anne Frank is moved from one concentration camp to another. She starts off with the others at the Westerbork transit camp. A month later, following a three-day long trip without food or water, they end up at Auschwitz, the enormous extermination camp in Poland. After almost two months, Anne and Margot are sent to Bergen-Belsen. 
She survives there for another five months until she finally succumbs to hunger, cold, exhaustion and sickness in March 1945. Just a few weeks later, the English liberate Bergen-Belsen. By that time, though, there are more dead people there than living. Margot always stays with Anne until she dies of typhus just before her little sister. Anne's mother dies of hunger and exhaustion in Auschwitz. Gusti van Pels dies during transport to Theresienstadt. Hermann van Pels dies in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. Peter van Pels dies in Mauthausen on May the 5th, 1945. Fritz Pfeffer dies in the Neuengammer work camp. Only Otto Frank would survive the ordeal. Of the 107,000 Dutch Jews deported to the concentration camps, only 5,000 survive. In May of 1945, the German army surrenders. The war is over, the Nazis have been defeated. In June of 1945, Otto Frank returns to the Netherlands. Victor Kuchler and Jo Kleiman have survived their arrest. After Otto hears what has happened to his wife and children, Meep gives him Anne's diary. He reads everything she has written, including her wish to turn her diary into a book. He collates all her notes and he publishes her diary. By doing this, he fulfills his daughter's wish to become a writer. I returned and after I had the news that my children would not come back, Meep gave me the diary which had been saved by, I should say, a miracle. It took me a very long time to read it and I must say I was very much surprised about the deep thoughts on the head. Her seriousness, especially her self-criticism, it was quite a different Anna I had known as my daughter. She never really showed this kind of inner feeling. She talked about many things, we criticized many things, but what really their feelings were, I only could see from the diary.